What we'll do today is share why mandated reporter training is important, not only from a compliance standpoint, but also from a risk management practice. We'll also demonstrate how compliance can be streamlined with our Keenan Safe Schools Learning Management System. Before we begin, let me just quickly introduce today's panel. We are very appreciative to have Lou Leone with us today. Lou is a partner with the law firm of Stubbs & Leone. Lou was a contributing author to our Keenan Safe Schools course on Mandated Reporter. He has over 25 years experience representing public schools, community colleges, and municipalities in California. And Lou is a frequent lecturer at various public entity organizations. Lou will be providing his legal opinion and recommendations to help school personnel comply with the requirements of AB 1432, and he'll help us navigate some of the gray areas that many of our clients have been asking questions about. We also have Ron Martin, JPA Manager for Northern California Relief, together with the Southern California Affiliate works with 444 public school agencies representing 2 million in ADA and 51 billion in total insured value. Ron has personally worked very closely with school districts managing issues around child abuse and molestation, and he's here to share insight from a claims and risk management perspective. Also joining us is Kathy Espinoza, Assistant Vice President of Ergonomics and Safety. Kathy is the Product Manager for our Keenan Safe Schools Safe Colleges, and Safe Personnel Suite of Resources. Kathy will be sharing more about our learning management system and how that can help you ease compliance. And finally, I'm Christine Gervasi. I'm Vice President in our Property and Casualty Practice. I'm responsible for our PNC Integrated Service Team, which includes account managers and claims analysts who partner with many of you and assist with risk management, training, and compliance. And I'll be providing an overview of AB 1432. So let's get started. I'll turn this over to Ron Martin, who's going to set the stage for why mandated reporter training is so important. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm Ron Martin, JPA Manager for Northern California Relief, and um, I wanted to let everyone know that April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. It's a nationally recognized um, prevention month, and really for society to create uh, a month dedicated to child abuse and prevention really depicts the uh, seriousness of this issue. So uh, the task here is uh, you're supposed to be able to send your kids to school knowing that they're going to be safe. And this actually came from a child abuse victim. And it's pretty staggering that the statistics on child sexual molestation in public schools um, is, based, is a silent epidemic. One of the reports mandated by Congress estimates that as many as 4.5 million students nationwide out of 50 million American kids in schools are subject to some sort of sexual misconduct by an employee of a school sometime between kindergarten and 12th grade. And this, this figure also includes verbal harassment that's sexual in nature. So over the last four years, we've seen a significant rise in claims filed against districts for physical and sexual abuse. Many of these claims are involving single perpetrator with multiple victims. In many of these cases, we've seen district employees have prior notice years before the bad actor is arrested, and we have additional incidents taking place from that first date of notice. So when that case occurs, we have little to no defense in these types of cases and they become extremely expensive. You can see here by the chart, you know, that's our largest exposure. If we're not reporting, uh, things don't go real well for us, but if we uh, do have instances where we're reporting right away, uh, it gives us a little bit better, more to talk about in resolving these claims. And obviously this issue's been highly publicized, uh, and it's all over the the press, and the, the most visible case right now uh, involves LAUSD. And uh, in that case, go to the next slide. 
you can see that uh, that district entered into a, a settlement for $139 million, and that involves a single perpetrator, multiple victim type of case. Obviously, this is a case in the extreme, but it does uh, uh, identify that uh, these things can be extremely expensive, especially if you're a larger district with high uh, visibility. And also we're seeing uh, district attorneys taking a more proactive approach against those district employees that aren't uh, uh, reporting as required as a mandated reporter. As you can see here, here's a sample of a, a principal in San Jose that uh, uh, was actually prosecuted uh, by the courts for failure to report. And in this particular case, she thought she she would do her own investigation and thought she was doing the right thing. It turned out uh, she wasn't following the letter of the law, so therefore she was prosecuted. So as we look at, uh, you know, LA Unified, you know, this can happen to, to any district regardless of size. And uh, the amount of claims that we're seeing really are staggering. You can see here we got $3 million uh settlement, $3.9 million verdict, $4.75 million for hiring a convicted offender, $5 million, $6.75, you know, all the way uh, across there. So what, really what we're seeing is subsequent to the Jerry Sandusky case at Penn State, uh, sexual abuse molestation claims litigation in California has been on a meteoric rise. And it's increased as much as 50% a year over the last three years. And what we're seeing is settlements and verdicts surrounding these losses are escalating at extremely rapid pace, and they're consistently reaching or exceeding a million dollars per claim. And, you know, we look at this not just from a sexual perspective, um, it's physical abuse. And we've had situations where we've had special education teachers physically abusing autistic students, and the teachers relocated to another site, and uh, it's alleged that uh, this particular teacher abused additional students, so we've got a total of 15 plaintiffs, and a uh, case has been resolved for $8 million to date with still some claims outstanding. And to top that off, a neighboring district had basically a, a similar type of claim with the same set of incidents involving special ed. So it's across the board. It's not just, you know, the sexual claims that we need to uh, uh, report. And what we've got here is just kind of talked about the Sandusky case, and um, this chart shows the frequency and severity trends statewide for our K-12 pools. And you can see there, it's been on the rise. Sandusky is right around uh, between fiscal year 2010 and 11. You can see that spike up in frequency, which is the darker uh, uh, bar in the chart. And then the yellow really depicts the uh, total incurred, which is the losses that we're paying. And in 2013, we've had multiple claims with single perpetrator, multiple victim. So as you can see, it's not just, it's nationwide, it's statewide, and it's specific to our pools. And as a result of that, uh, there's legislation that was enacted in regards to the mandated reporter because what the state was saying is not just specific to our pools, is that employees weren't necessarily doing the reporting as they should be. So uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Christine to talk about the, the new legislation and uh, the solutions that uh, Keenan can provide to assist you to make sure that you're in compliance. Thank you, Ron. So as you heard from Ron, the exposure to school districts is staggering, and even more concerning is the impact the abuse and neglect cases have on, on children. Clearly, more needs to be done to protect the children. The California legislature, under the leadership of Assembly Member Mike Gatto, passed AB 1432, and it went into effect on January 1st. 2015. Now, AB 1432 does not change the law regarding who is a mandated reporter, but it does, requ does create a new requirement to train mandated reporters. 
And AB 1432, it applies to school districts, county office of education, special uh, state special districts, and charter schools. And while AB 1432 does not specifically address community colleges, you'll hear, you'll hear throughout this webinar why we recommend community colleges provide this training. The mandated reporter training applies to all school employees and school administrators and those who are not only in contact with children, but those who supervise others who are in contact with children. So I'll ask Lou to, to chime in here um, in terms of, you know, do you agree that AB 1432, it essentially applies to almost all school district employees? What are your thoughts on that, Lou? Well, I would agree with that. And the important thing to remember with AB 1432 is that prior to its enactment, there was no training uh, requirement uh, for mandated reporters. And what we have seen historically in the cases that we've handled is that many of the teachers that have been on the job for a substantial period of time really did not understand what their obligations were relative to reporting, whereas the newer teachers uh, did since that is part of their overall credentialing program. So this law was put in place to really roll back time and have everybody have a refresher course on what their obligations were and moreover, have that refresher course every year. So it applies to pretty much everybody in the school district setting. Uh, matter of fact, we recommend that almost all employees uh, be trained uh, in mandated reporting. So if we look at the training objectives of AB 1432, there's basically three components um, in order to meet compliance. Number one, training must include how to detect child abuse and neglect. Number two, it must train on how to report suspected uh, cases of child abuse and neglect. And then also what the consequences are for failing to report suspected child abuse and neglect. So it's got to include those three uh, training components. So let, let's talk about mandatory reporters and a little bit more um, about who they are. As we mentioned previously, as Lou mentioned, essentially all school district personnel are mandated reporters. AB 1432 in the Penal Code will define mandated reporters as school employees or administrators who are in contact with children on a regular basis, and it specific, specifically states it includes those, as I said, who supervise other employees who are in contact with children on a regular basis. So a complete list um, is in the penal code, but examples include teachers, administrators, substitute teachers, counselors, your coaches, which includes your walk-on coaches and your assistant coaches, and then your classified employees who are in contact with or supervise uh, those who are around students. Now, now effective, to, Jen, go ahead, Lou. You need to remember that the entire purpose of the mandated reporting laws are for educators and those that are in you know, consistent contact with children to protect them uh, from any type of abuse. And we see that many teachers uh, tend to weigh the balance of, of their obligation to protect a child uh, from abuse and their obligation or feelings uh, towards the teacher in the next classroom who they may suspect is conducting the abuse. So we really need to hit hard on the educators and our school district staff that it is their job, it is their obligation, both legally and morally, to protect these children from being abused. And we need to start from that point and move forward from there. So effective January 1st, 2015, school districts are required to annually train employees within six weeks of the start of the school year. And Lou, if you can help us define what is meant by the start of the school year and if a district can train prior to the start of their school year, this is an area we're hearing a lot of questions around. Well, the statute itself says start of the school year, and it provides no definition beyond that. So what I believe is, is the intent of it is that to have a trigger point saying our school year started this date. And that can be when the students arrive or it could be when the teachers arrive. Many school districts have their teachers come in a week or so before the students to set up classrooms and, and uh, get situated. 
So you can do the start of the school year when your teachers arrive. It could be when your CBA, your collective bargaining agreement, says when the school year starts or when the children arrive. So it's purposely uh, flexible for you to have that uh, ability to define it for yourselves. Uh, with respect to can you train a few weeks prior to the start of the school year, the law is pretty clear. It says within six weeks of the start of the school year. So I don't think you're going to get into a great deal of trouble if you cheat a little bit on, on the training, but the law is pretty clear. It's the start of the school year, so I would stick with that uh, so you're in literal compliance with what the statute has to say. So again, it can be when the teachers arrive, it can be when the students arrive, uh, or any or either of those options. And also effective January 1st, school districts are required to train all new hires within six weeks of the start of their employment or their data hire. So Lou, can you elaborate a little bit on, you know, district, districts are asking if they can require proof of completing the training as a condition to employment, and can this training be completed prior to the employee's date of hire? Well, this is, again, another vagueness in the statute itself. Uh, I mean, if you read the statute literally, which you should probably do to be in strict compliance, it provides that the mandated, mandated reporting training shall be provided to school personnel hired during the course of the school year. So that means when the person starts, they have to be trained. And the best practice is simply to have your uh, employee that comes on board uh, trained within those six weeks and have them receive your training rather than asking them for compliance or proof of compliance prior uh, thereto. So to be in literal uh, compliance with the law, I would have the person trained on your program or in your method within those first six weeks. Substitutes are considered employees and are mandated reporters. Therefore, they're also uh, required to be trained. And Lou, this is an area where we've received several questions. Um, can a school district require proof of training as a condition to placing a sub on that substitute list? And many substitutes work for more than one school district. So would a certificate of training from one school district be sufficient proof of compliance at another school district? What are your thoughts? Well, if the training that they received at uh, a neighboring school district was done during that school year, uh, then requiring proof uh, is, is a good idea. It, it certainly can assist you in making that decision. But if you want to belt and suspend the scenario with hiring a substitute, I would have them go through the training at your individual school district within the first week, six weeks of uh, their employment. Uh, again, the statute is vague in this respect, so I don't I can't really give you a definitive answer, which is a typical lawyer answer anyway. Uh, but I would really you know, make sure that the training they received elsewhere uh, was during that particular school year, uh, that it was a sound uh, program. And if you're not sure, then simply put them through the training in your program within the first six weeks. Now, Lou, volunteers are not mandated reporters, but the penal code does encourage training. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of a good risk management practice for schools to train their volunteers? Well, if you look at it from the point of view of these are volunteers and people that are in contact with children and our obligations as an organization is to protect the children, simply ask yourself, why not train them? Uh, there's no harm in doing so, uh, and it may benefit your children and the community at large. So the best practice in my mind is to train them as well. And then for contractors, you know, many schools have vendors, contractors, even temporary employees, and they're not specifically addressed in AB 1432. But, Lou, I know you have recommendations that school districts should consider when they're working with, with these types of, of individuals. If you're going to be bringing in outside vendors, I think one of the critical things you need to do is in your contract with the outside vendors or your RFP, however you're structured, is to uh, mandate in the contract that any employee that is at a school site or that is anywhere working in close proximity uh, to children uh, receive the mandated uh, training and that they receive it uh, from your program and there's proof that they in fact have. The other thing you really need to do is in the same contract, make sure that you are indemnified 
uh, from the contractor for any claims that may arise uh, from any of their employees acting inappropriately with children or failing to report uh, suspected child abuse. Those would be some of the key things that I would suggest you do. And then what about um, categorical employees? Many districts have a categorical program where employees are hired, they're paid through the district, they're for specific programs for specific periods of time. Lou, this is another area we're getting a lot of questions about. Should school districts treat their categorical employees the same for purposes of mandated reporter training, and would a prior certificate of completion be acceptable? If they're working at a school site, I would require them to receive the training through the school district's own program uh, within the six weeks. Uh, that would be in, in full compliance uh, with the law. If they're around students uh, sporadically, uh, then it's a closer call as to whether or not you should mandate that they undergo the training. But again, it doesn't hurt to have them do so. I guess the and overall, would... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I guess the overriding theme I'm presenting to you all is that it doesn't hurt to train them. What I've seen is, is, is situations where school districts uh, find themselves in trouble by not training and by not reporting. So if you do the reverse, you'll be in a much stronger position. And would you also recommend that they have the categorical employees also sign the statement that they're mandated reporters? I don't know about that one, to be honest with you, because they may, in fact, not be depending upon their status and how you know, how much they interact with, with students. So I'm not sure that you need to do that. However, if you put them through the training, you're going to have proof that they did receive the training and they understand what they were taught. So I mentioned earlier um, that 801432 does not specifically apply to community colleges. However, many communi co community colleges have minor students on campus. They have child development centers, daycare centers. Um, in addition, many community colleges have summer programs, including summer camps that offer programs for the K-12 uh, age range students. So, Lou, can you share with us what, you, what your recommendations are for community colleges in terms of training their staff in this area? Well, many community colleges, as you mentioned, have daycare facilities. So they have programs where uh, they're uh, educating students under the age of 18. Uh, so most of these programs are under the auspices of mandated reporting, meaning that the people that are running the program, the people that are interacting uh, with the students and with the children are mandated reporters. However, uh, AB 1432 does not require that they be trained. But I ask you again, why not? Even though it's not required by law, it certainly puts you in a much stronger position if, in fact, you've trained these individuals that are in direct contact with these uh, students under the age of 18. So I would recommend that you do train uh, and uh, that you do so uh, on a yearly basis. For example, if you follow 1432, even though you're not technically required, you're really setting a very nice standard for yourself to follow through and making sure that your staff understands their obligations. So if we've talked a lot about um, who a mandated reporter is and who should be trained. Um, let's take a few minutes and look at who mandated reporters should be reporting to. Uh, the law requires that a mandated reporter notify their local child protective services or local police um, and sheriff's department of suspected uh, child abuse and neglect. And that report must be made telephonically immediately and then followed by a written report within 36 hours. So it's recommended that um, mandated reporters report to both the local child protective services as well as their local police or sheriff's department. And it's important to understand that reporting to your school's police or campus security is not compliant. So there's also several uh, civil and criminal immunities that mandated reporters should understand, as well as rules around confidentiality and penalties for failing to report. So I'm going to turn this over to Lou, and Lou's going to talk to you about these three important areas. 
the California legislature, in dealing with the Mandated Reporting Act, determined that it wants to encourage mandated reporters to report suspected child abuse. So in, in an effort to really promote that, there is statutory protection afforded to mandated reporters, meaning that if a mandated reporter uh, reports suspected child abuse, they're immune from any criminal or civil liability for reporting. Uh, and it goes so far as to say that they are immune from criminal or civil liability, even if the report is incorrect, even if the report was negligently made, even if the report was reckless, even if the report was intentionally false. That's how much protection is afforded to mandated reporters under California uh, law to protect them from being sued or criminally prosecuted for their uh, reporting. Now, this immunity only applies to mandated reporters. It doesn't apply to uh, those that are not mandated reporters. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's a few quirks in the federal law about immunity uh, that I don't want to really trouble you with right now. But under California law, a mandated reporter is, is pretty much bulletproof and immune. Uh, in the event that there is a civil action brought against a mandated reporter, they have a right under California law to be reimbursed for their reasonable attorney's fees in defending the action. Uh, so again, the California statutes are written in such a way that they really want to encourage uh, reporting of suspected child abuse. I'm done, Christine. Yeah, I, I advanced it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got you're going to cover confidentiality on the next slide. I am, and the the issue with confidentiality is, is again the statutes provide that the mandated reporter's identity is is confidential. However, in, in reality, that's not always how it turns out. Uh, so to tell somebody that if you are a mandated reporter and you report that people will never know your identity is simply not accurate in the real world. Uh, for example, if there's criminal prosecution against a perpetrator, if there's civil lawsuits against a perpetrator in the school district, quite often the CPS report uh, is, is provided uh, to others and the identity of the person that made the initial report is, um, is revealed. So it's a bit of a misnomer to say that it's 100% uh, confidential. And some of the questions that people have raised is, you know, as a mandated reporter, uh, who at the district should I inform of the suspected child abuse or neglect? Well, you need to comply with the law, which means you have to notify the police or, or CPS. And you have to be very careful about who you notify at your own school district because that may be one of the people involved. Uh, so I recommend that you, you notify CPS, you notify the police, you do everything that the mandated reporting statutes require of you. And then you can tell your principal, you can tell your superintendent or someone else, uh, but don't go to them first and ask what to do. Uh, your obligation to report is your obligation and no one else's, quite frankly. Uh, whether or not you should tell the parents or the guardians, uh, uh, you know, they may find out at some point in time, but I wouldn't tell them. I would do the report and turn this over to the professionals, to the police, to CPS, because for all you know, the parents may in fact be those that are abusing the child. And, you know, going on to the identity issue, I believe I've, I've kind of covered that. Uh, again, it, it will become known at some point in time if there's a criminal prosecution or a civil litigation. And then, Lou, can you cover penalties for failing to report? Yeah, the penalties, uh, it's an interesting uh, issue in the law here, is if you report, you really have no exposure to criminal or civil liability if you're a mandated reporter. The reverse is that if you fail to report, you can be placed in jail. You can get six months in jail, uh, be fined. You can get up to a year in jail. Uh, you can lose your credential. Uh, you can lose your ability to find future employment. And by that, I mean once these things become publicly known about, but through a civil lawsuit or a criminal prosecution, the individual that failed to report is quite often identified. And it goes on the Internet, and that person has a rough time um, finding any employment moving forward. So, you know, there's substantial penalties for failing to report, and there are zero penalties for uh, reporting. So weigh those in making your decisions. So 
so there's there's several options in order to uh, receive the training that's required um, by this law. The California Department of Education, they have posted an online uh, training course on their website. Keenan, through the Keenan Safe Schools and Keenan Safe Colleges platform, offers a 32-minute course, which Kathy will be discussing um, shortly. And then, of course, there's other training um, vendors that provide online as well as live options. So, Lou, we're, we're often asked by a school district if they want to use a uh, training course other than what's provided by the California Department of Education, does that school district need to pass a board resolution in order to do so? It's not required. Uh, a good practice would be to do so for the simple fact that you involve your uh, board into making a decision about what program is going to be utilized. And you have to report to the Department of Education about what program you're going to be use, using if, in fact, you're not using the DOE program. So it would be nice to have the, the, quote, fingerprints, close quote, of your board members on that decision. But it's not required. But I'd recommend that you do it. And exactly like uh, Lou just mentioned, if you are going to use a course other than what's provided by the California Department of Education, there is a report that needs to be um, submitted. Um, it's on the Department of Education's website. You see a picture of it here as well. We've also put it on our Keenan Safe Schools, Safe Colleges platform, as well as PNC Bridge to make it convenient um, for our clients. We have pre-filled this form, although it is Editable, so you're able to share with the, the California Department of Education um, any information or thoughts as to why you're using um, an alternate course. Um, so, Lou, do you have any thoughts in terms of when this report is due and how frequently it should be filed with the California Department of Education? Uh, AB 1432 just simply says you shall report it uh, to uh, the DOE. It doesn't tell you when to do it. So I would recommend that you do it at the beginning of your school year, again, recognizing that that's sort of a flexible concept uh, that you all can decide on when that school year starts. So I would do it at the, at the commencement of the school year and uh, send it to DOE. Now, in addition to sending the report to the um, Department of Education, you're also required to report to your local uh, governing board, and what the law says is that you're to develop a process that demonstrates proof of compliance. Um, this could be, you know, providing your board copies of training sign-in sheets, certificates of completion, or you might uh, generate a report from your online uh, learning management system in order to show your board um, that you're in compliance. Uh, Lou, can you share any thoughts as to when school districts should report to their local governing boards and how frequently? Well, it's really up to your uh, local school district and your local governing board. What I would suggest is, is that you either put together an administrative regulation uh, that would you know, put forth specific time frames as to when you're going to report back to the governing board about how things are going. And that's really for the administration uh, to decide how frequently you want to do it. I mean, minimally, I would suggest you do it at the end of the school year. Uh, but if you feel that it's a more frequent uh, need to report to the governing board, that's fine as well. Okay, I'm going to turn this back over to Ron Martin. He's going to talk about penalties for not reporting, why record retention is critical, and why compliance with this training requirement is so important. Yeah, thanks, Christine. A lot of the uh, we get a lot of questions uh, in this regard, and actually, AB 1432 does not include any penalties for districts failure to train district employees. So the employee has the obligation and there's ramifications, but there's nothing in the law that um, penalizes districts for not. However, um, non-compliance with the training requirements really could potentially increase liability in these uh, types of child abuse allegations. And also districts are going to be faced with a lot of, or are faced with a lot of public uh, scrutiny. So one of the questions will be is, you know, did you guys train? And the answer is no, that's not going to look good if you're not in compliance with the law. From a record uh, retention standpoint, 
the other challenge facing uh, school districts is there were some amendments to the, the legislation um, in the Civil Code of Procedure 340.1 now allows minors till the age of 26 to file a lawsuit. So they no longer have to file a tort claim. So we have this extended exposure uh, in relation to these types of claims. So if you have a kindergartner today in 2015, they have until 2035, basically, 2036, to file a lawsuit. So it's critical that we have this record retention that, you know, if there is a lawsuit down the line, that there's proof that the district provided this training. And then again, I talked a little bit earlier about the higher severity claims development. You know, the one thing we want to avoid is the single perpetrator, multiple victim with a failure to report. Um, again, that's why it's critical that this training take place. And then lastly, um, there's some litigation going around Cal 200 that is a compliance-related issue as it relates to uh, physical education minutes. And the same theory could hold true for school districts that don't comply with AB 1432. Um, there's a big probability that a district could receive a lawsuit um, for being out of compliance, thus subjecting um, the district to litigation. And if we go to the next slide here, it kind of puts it all into perspective. Although you're not required, there are ramifications for not uh, doing the training. Um, you know, if, if we're in a situation where you do get a claim, the first thing plaintiff attorneys are going to ask is, during discovery, they're going to ask for uh, the district to provide proof that they've done the mandatory reporter training. And then secondarily, um, as I mentioned before, districts could have these injunctive relief lawsuits. So, for example, if you do not, if you're not in compliance with the law, they can uh, file an injunctive relief suit to show that you're not in compliance, thus subjecting you to some attorney fee issues. And then again, the negative publicity and mistrust of the community if you're not following the letter of the law. And then lastly, um, the failure to, to document and train is going to increase the settlement amounts. So I want to talk a little bit about these compliance issues and why they're so important. Um, in these attorney fee statutory compliance cases, a plaintiff not be a resident of the particular district. So if you're in Southern California, you could have someone in Northern California make a public information request against your district on these compliance issues. And then also what we're seeing, uh, like this Cal 200, is multiple districts are involved in the same compliance issue. Um, and that underlying complaint, I think we had over 65 districts statewide that were part of this particular litigation. And really the reason why a lot of these attorneys are pursuing this is that they can recover fees uh, in regards to what's included in the private attorney general statute. And really uh, what that says is that it allows for, next slide please, it allows for plaintiff attorney fees if the party prevails uh, in the public interest. So um, if you're out of compliance, they can say, we've identified that you're out of compliance, forcing you to get into compliance, and under the statute, it entitles them to attorney's fees. So not only are you going to be subject to attorney fee uh, fines and penalties, but also you're going to have to incur the cost of defense counsel to defend you in these lawsuits. And this could be a, a, a pretty large exposure. Now, Lou, if, if I'm a district and I train 98% of my employees, am I potentially subject to uh, an injunctive relief claim entitling yet the attorney fees? Uh, yes. You're either in compliance or you're not in compliance. There's not any concept known as almost in compliance. Uh, so you have to have complete compliance, otherwise you can be subjected to one of these types of lawsuits. It just as a follow-up to Ron's comment, what you see as a prelude to this type of lawsuit is a, it's a request under the California Public Records Act asking you for proof that you're in compliance with AB 1432. 
and that should give you a hint that somebody is fishing around looking for uh, school districts and colleges and others that are out of compliance uh, with the appropriate law. So just be aware of that. And the attorney fee awards, at least in Northern California, uh, that the attorneys are getting in these types of cases range from anywhere from $500 to $900 per hour. Uh, so they're being awarded substantial sums of money if, in fact, they bring, uh, bring about compliance through litigation or other means. Yeah, and what, what we've seen is that five hundred to nine hundred dollars per hour ranges anywhere between thirty to to fifty thousand dollars in attorney fees for these types of uh, 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 injunctive relief uh, litigation. And, and really, what happens is they prove that you're out of compliance, and then you tell them, "Well, we're going to get into compliance." Once you're in compliance, you're then going to have to more than likely provide some sort of additional reporting and in institute policies to make sure you're compliant and they're going to monitor to make sure that you're 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 in compliance. So that's going to add another added layer if you get into these types of situations. Thanks Ron and Lou. So obviously compliance is is absolutely critical and being able to, you know, easily and efficiently demonstrate and show proof that you're in compliance is, is very important. So I'm going to turn this over to Kathy Espinoza. She's going to give you a uh, an overview of why online training and learning management systems are so important in helping schools comply with this mandated reporter training and specifically the compliance and the reporting uh, requirements. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Christine. Um, Keenan Safe Schools and Keenan Safe College is one of your options for training for mandated reporter types of training. So we have a current course here that is 32 minutes in length that covers all three of the aspects that Christine mentioned earlier. So it is in compliance with AB 1432. Some of the things that we want to highlight is that it's ease of use. So in getting your data to us, we can help you create these bundles or packets that are automatically assigned to any new hire that starts at any point during the year, as well as designing a back-to-school training plan that automatically sends out the mandated reporter training. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about these types of programs to make, show you just how easy this is. For Keenan Safe Schools and Safe Colleges, we ask that you keep a census upload current. And typically districts do this once or twice during the school year, usually always at the beginning of a school year, they send us the data. And it's just basically the username, first and last name, where do they work, what building, email, and now we've added a column that says hire date. And the reason we do that is that we can track were the new hires trained within six weeks of their particular start date. So just bringing us over the census upload, we can do the rest, and that helps get your site correctly loaded. Again, once you get into the school, state schools and state college systems, you're going to find a row of tabs across the top. We've got training plans. And you can simply click on a new hire training plan, or you can work with your Keenan account manager, and they can walk you right through this. And you can choose the courses that you want every new hire to take, whether it be bloodborne pathogens, you want mandated reporter training in there. Um, so we can also create, right now we've got new hire training plans, Offline training sessions, this is one you would use in case you did hire a lawyer in to give mandated reporter training. You can take the sign-in sheet and go ahead and give credit to all those people in that session. And that's a good, easy way to keep all documents, all data into one compliance system. Other things we have with the Keenan Safe Schools is that you've got a preference down here on the preference tab for email reminders. Now, I do know that the uh, Department of Education has got a fabulous course on their site for everyone to use as well. Their course runs at about an hour and a half, and the employee goes in, takes the course, passes the quiz, gets their certificate, and has to go deliver that down to HR. 
here we've got a built-in reminder system that helps many HR directors so they're not hounding their employees. And you can choose your preference. Do you want to send it every two weeks, every three weeks? And you can write the email itself. So that makes that compliance that much easier for you. Um, again, as Lou mentioned, we've got the CDE is requiring an alternative training form be submitted that says you are using a different training other than what the state is providing. So you'll notice on any of the Keenan Safe Schools, Keenan Safe College courses, when you go to a sign and you will see this yellow and red triangle with an exclamation point right in the center. Okay, that typically, when you click on it, means there's an additional action that you need to do in order to be compliant. It's a backup reminder for you. So on mandated reporter training, we have got this little marker for compliance. Once you click on that, you get the CDE alternative training form. And what we've done is that we have filled that out for you so that it gives you the training topics that are covered and an outline of the training that's used. Okay, we also have a bottom portion where the CDE is asking why you chose an alternative training. This one is fillable. So we've got sample verbiage in there if you'd want to use it if you're using Keen and Safe Schools, but you're more than welcome to fill in what else other reasons you've chosen to use a different training platform. Now, uh, running a compliance report for your board is very simple. Or, you know, I mean, if you are the person that's in charge of this compliance, you may want to run this report on a monthly basis just to see how you're doing, whether you're at 48% or 98%. Because, again, as Lou mentioned, almost compliant is not compliant. So it's very simple to run a report. We've got a whole tab for that. And you just run compliance by person, and you screen it down here on the bottom under course. So mandate, mandatory reporting course, generate an Excel report, and you will be able to see who has the assignment out there, who has it completed, percent of people completing it. So it's a real quick, real-time report that you could run once a month, once a year, once a week, whatever your preference is. So just to summarize, the Keenan Safe School Safe College Mandated Reporter training course is 32 minutes in length. Okay? It can be bookmarked. So teachers and staff can take it five minutes here, five minutes there, and it will bookmark so they don't have to start all over again. The system can automatically assign the mandatory, mandatory training to all new hires within the six weeks of hire, and we can set it up for a back-to-school bundle so we have all employees trained at the start of that school year. Easy email reminders so that you are not hounding them to get this done. You can pull stats on completion. Okay. And it's also I want to remind you that it was expert authored. Eve Pearl, who's the executive director for the Council on Child Abuse nationally, wrote the course with significant contributions from Lou Leon. So we definitely appreciate that expertise and Lou's adding to that. So we have a very California-specific course. One of the things also that I want to mention is ADA compliance with this course. So not only can they read through the course, but it has an auditory component. So those employees that are blind can still take the course, so it is ADA compliant for them. Okay, if anybody's got any questions for any of us on the webinar, I want you to encourage you to put them into that chat window. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back on over to Christine. Thank you so much, Kathy. We've received um, actually a lot of really great questions. But before I get to those, I am required to read this short disclaimer. Keenan & Associates is an insurance brokerage and consulting firm. It is not a law firm or an accounting firm. We do not give legal advice or tax advice, and neither this presentation, the answers provided during the question and answer period, nor the documents accompanying this presentation constitutes or should be construed as legal or tax advice. 
you're advised to follow up with your own legal counsel and or tax advisor discuss how this information might affect you. So we've got a lot of really great questions and um, Lou, I think a lot of these questions I'm going to um, direct over to you. Um, it's 9.51. We might go a little bit over uh, 10 o'clock because we want to make sure that we can get these questions answered and it's part of our recording today. So if you're available to stick with us a little bit, bit past 10, that would be great. Otherwise, um, we will be providing the questions and answers along with the recorded webinar and the PowerPoint uh, presentation tomorrow. So uh, let's get started uh, with the questions. Um, Lou, one of the, the first questions I think I'll throw out there, um, some districts, many districts have um, district employees who do not work with students. They're maybe in the district office. Are they required to take the mandated reporter course? If they are not mandated reporters, then they're not required to take the course. Uh, the uh, penal code section that defines mandated reporter in dealing with these types of, of individuals provides that a mandated reporter is an administrator or employee of a public or private organization whose duties reg require direct contact and supervision of children. As such, if you have your desk clerk at your district uh, headquarters and that person never interacts with students, they would not be a mandated reporter and as such not required to receive the training. The difficulty you may have is, is individuals that do interact with students uh, somewhat. And at what point does that interaction become to the point where they're actually being involved with students in a substantial level. So you have to be very careful about that if, in fact, you have a hybrid employee that is in contact with students on some occasions but not all occasions. And at that point in time, that person may fall within the category of a mandated reporter requiring training. And, and Lou, we talked about contractors and outside consultants. We have a question here that says if a contractor or consultant is not a mandated reporter, they're not a government employee, how can a district make them take the training? The, under the mandated reporting laws, they may fall within the, confine, the definition of a mandated reporter if, in fact, they're in direct contact with uh, students, or at least enough in contact with students that they may potentially pose a risk. Uh, you know, I'm looking for the section of the education code that will, excuse me, that of the penal code that will help us in this regard, and I'll find it and we'll circle back to this in a minute. Perfect. And while, while uh, you're looking at that, I'm actually going to throw a uh, question over to Kathy. Um, We've got a question that says, can uh, PNC Bridge or Keenan Safe Schools, can the training, the mandated reporter training, be used for other than district employees, such as volunteers, contractors, and vendors, and if so, how? So maybe you could touch briefly on the self-registration feature or any other component of the learning management system. Certainly. Keenan Safe Schools and Safe Colleges comes with a self-registration feature. So people that are not part of that employee census upload data spreadsheet, they are given a key, a certain number of, you know, alphanumeric code they can put in. They can be assigned and go ahead and get permission to take that course. And they just take it and it's documented that they've got it done. So it's a real simple process to do. Perfect. And Lou, if you're ready, can I come back to you with a couple more questions? We've just got so many great questions here. No, absolutely. Perfect. Getting back to that original question, you can require that they undergo the training as part of your contractual agreement with them. That will be a contractual issue. And looking over the mandated reporter definitions, they would technically not be defined as mandated reporters and therefore not covered under the training requirement. However, that does not mean you still cannot require them to undergo the training. And again, if they're going to be in contact with students or they're going to be working at a school site, uh, doing construction work or any number of things, I would suggest that you have them undergo the training and make that part of your contractual agreement with the outside vendor. Perfect. Um, here's a question uh, regarding summer uh, programs. Um, the question is, I run a three, I run three seven-day theater camps. 
for ages 9 through 18. I hire actors that are college students as well as more seasoned actors uh, as instructors. Some come from other states for this three-week camp. So uh, as a director of the program, would it suffice if I only trained mandated reporters? The, it only requires that you train mandated reporters. I mean, that's all the law really requires at this, at this point. So if they're not within the definitions of mandated reporter, then there's no obligation to train. But you have to remember this, is that if, in fact, you get sued by a, a child who is molested or abused, and you have to explain why you train some people and not others, you better be able to articulate a very strong reason for that. And to simply say the law did not require me to do so doesn't really sit well uh, with a jury, which is comprised of parents for the most part. So again, you get back to the basic philosophy, how does it hurt you to train them or to let them at least be aware of what their obligations may in fact be or what they should look for as part of, of looking for child abuse. So I, I don't think you become hurt by the training, whereas the flip could certainly be true, is if you don't train and it comes back to haunt you, you're going to have some explaining to do as to why you didn't provide blanket training. And Lou, here's another question. How would we handle, how would you recommend district handle employees that are off work on an extended leave? Well, before they come back, if they haven't received the training during that particular school year, before they come back, I would have them trained before they return to the classroom or to their job. If they receive the training that school year and they're gone, you know, midterm, then then you're fine. But if they did not get the training that school year and they're still technically employees, I would have them trained before they return. And we, and we have a question here regarding um, offline training. So I know, you know, AB 1432 requires training of mandated reporters. The Department uh, of Education has provided the online course you can use or you can use alternative courses, but there's nothing to suggest you can't do live training um, or some other type of offline training. Do you, have a, do you agree with that, Lou, and anything else to add to that? No, you certainly can do live training. Uh, our office, in fact, does uh, quite a bit of that. Uh, the live training is, is uh, preferred with some school districts because it allows an interactive process with their teachers and staff. But as long as the training covers the mandated reporting laws and the requirements, uh, then you'd be in compliance uh, with what the statute requires. Perfect. Hey, Christine, this is, this is Kathy. Um, with the mandated reporter course, you can put the contact name on there. So if somebody's got questions, they can simply email the contact for their district and get their questions answered. Perfect. And, and Kathy, a couple follow-up questions for you. Um, somebody's asking for clarification um, that if a district trains through Keenan Safe Schools mandated reporter course, are they required to take an additional training course outside of Keenan? So that's question number one. Okay, question number one, the answer is no. Okay, they don't have to take an additional course. Our course covers all three of those areas for compliance, and it's recorded in a learning management system, so that tracking it is easy. And then the next question is, will we be compliant if we present the uh, Keenan State Schools uh, program at our back to school orientation to all employees at once so long as I have a sign in sheet of those in attendance. Yes. And because and we can take that sign in sheet and then we can go ahead and upload, give everybody offline credit. I have districts that do that. They they play the course on an L C D projector for everybody sitting there. Then they take the sign in sheets and upload them into the system. Thank you. Lou, here's a question for you. Uh, the question is, I want to confirm for the 2014-2015 school year that only employees hired after January 1st, 2015 are required to take the course this year, and that next year is when all mandated reporters have the requirement 
you know, to be trained annually. You may have a confirmation of that. That's accurate. Excellent. Uh, what about a parent that is chaperoning a field trip and will be alone with students? Well, again, they're technically not mandated reporters. Uh, I mean, I would, I would caution not to let that happen. Always have two parents with the kids, uh, just from a, a best practices point of view. But no, they're not required to be trained, uh, at least not under the mandated reporting and training laws. Okay. Another question for you, Lou. If you are not identified as a mandated reporter, but are put through training as a best practice, are you truly without immunity? You are either a mandated reporter by statute or you're not. The fact that you receive the training does not automatically turn you into a mandated reporter if, in fact, you are not one to begin with. And uh, Kathy, this may be for you, although Lou uh, may want to chime in as well. The question is, uh, this is a district that has been using the, the CD that we burned, the 10 most important things you're required to know about mandated reporters. Um, is, is that sufficient as opposed to the 32-minute training course? Can you talk about what's in compliance there, Kathy? Sure. The CD, 10 Things You Must Know About Being a Mandated Reporter, is eight minutes in length, and it's not in compliance with the three requirements put out by AB 1432. So for Keenan Safe Schools and Colleges, the only compliant course is the one on mandatory reporting for 32 minutes. It covers all three of those areas. And that's something you got to watch out for, too, because a lot of competitors have got their own courses, and you've got to make sure that those three line items are covered in the courses. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and Lou, we have a question here that when an employee completes the training and submits the certificate, should that certificate be placed in the employee's personnel file or in a district report, like, you know, keeping just an Excel sheet with the employee's name and date completed? You know, from a litigation uh, point of view, I would prefer that it be placed in the employee's personnel file because quite often what happens in uh, if litigation ensues, they're going to ask where, you know, that this employee received training. It's always best to have uh, that in, in their personnel file. Now, keep in mind that their personnel file also contains their acknowledgement that they're a mandated reporter. So it would seem uh, good practice to keep those documents together, in addition to having a spreadsheet or something else uh, showing that uh, you're in compliance. So I would recommend that you add that to the personnel file. And, and Kathy, am I correct through the learning management system for a district that's using Keenan Safe Schools, they would also be able to go in and very easily print all those certificates as well as, a, as an extra safety net. Is that correct? That is correct. So it is an extra safety measure they might want to do, but it's all in those Excel spreadsheets in the reports. Perfect. Um, and then we have a question here, Kathy, uh, wanting to know if there's a DVD version of the online training that can be played for a group of employees and then use the sign-in sheet from compliance. So I think you talked a little bit, but maybe you can restate how to show this in a group setting and give credit. No problem. Um, what we do instead of a DVD, because it is obviously proprietary information, is we have the district start up their computer, log into the internet, Keen and Safe School program, run it through an LCD right up against the screen, and the program runs smoothly. Somebody can even turn off the audio portion and talk to each slide, or they can just let the audio portion run by itself. And then those people in attendance, you can take the sign-in sheet and give them offline credit. Very simple to do. Excellent. And Lou, I think this might be our last question. I think I got them all, but the question is, uh, for 12-month employees, can a district uh, provide the training prior to the end of the school year? 
the, the statute again talks about at the start of the school year. So I think that's the point in time when you have to do it with everyone. Uh, so quite frankly, I would not play around with that. I would do it at the commencement of your school year and make sure everybody is trained uh, from that point moving forward in compliance with AB uh, 1432. Perfect. And then we did get a couple questions about sample um, board resolution, sample contractual agreement language, and that's information that we um, are putting together and compiling. And, and if you have access to PNC Bridge, um, that information will be available in the near future. You can contact your Keenan uh, account manager uh, for that as well. So um, I think I got all the questions. We will go through just to make sure if I missed anything, we will make sure to include um, answers to those questions as part of um, the recording and the document um, that's coming out uh, tomorrow. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for participating today. A special thanks to you, Mr. Uh, Leon, for continuing to give your time so generously in helping to educate on this uh, important topic. You'll see we have our, our contact information is here. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to, to reach out to any one of us, and we'd be happy to um, assist you further. And on behalf of Lou and Ron, Kathy, and myself, we want to thank everyone for participating today and for your continued efforts in protecting children. Thanks. Have a great day.